Well, good morning and welcome to this Sunday service. Um, by way of announcement, I do apologize for no hymn music right now because uh, due to my circumstances and location, that was not able to happen today. But I promise you, next week, we will once again have our hymn music. Um, this morning, I wanted to speak to you a bit about the topic of prayer. And I'm taking this topic from Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, when Jesus gives instructions and he says, when you pray, when you pray, and then he elaborates. Well, that's the title of my message, when you pray. So this morning, we're going to learn a little bit about prayer. But before we do that, let us go before the Lord. Father, we do settle our hearts this morning, thanking you for the opportunity to gather together on your Lord's day. And Lord, we, we pray and we desire to know how to pray more fervently to you. So Lord, help us in this lesson today through your word that we might learn what it is to communicate, to talk with you as a friend, as our Lord as our God. And Father, we pray that you would give us your grace to make that a habit in our lives. For your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, I'm going to read to us from the Gospel of Matthew, beginning in chapter 6, with verse 5 to verse 15. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. But when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard from their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. The reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. You know, as I look at this passage and as we look at this passage this morning, the assumption is that we will pray, is that we do pray but especially that we will pray. Do you? Sometimes we forget to pray. James said, you have not because you ask not. Things in life that we would like that we, we don't have, James says, because we don't pray. We don't ask for it. Typically, most people pray when something bad happens in their life, when their struggle or something comes up, a circumstance, then they reach out to God. But many times it is just as simple as that. We have not prayed about it. And Jesus assumes when you pray, do it like this. He assumes we will be praying. And we notice also that he says, Be not as the hypocrites who love to pray in the synagogues and on the street corners. 
so that all people can see them, right? They wish to be known as men of prayer, to walk around as holier than thou, outwardly anyway. And beloved, that should never be us. Never. Jesus said of the scribes and the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23, verse 5, but all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and they enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost room at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men rabbi. Isn't it interesting that with position there comes pride and power, and it's still in the religious community today. There are those who love the titles, right? They love to be called, you know, the venerable, reverend, doctor, whatever. Um, I myself have a doctorate, but I tell everyone, call me Pastor Tim, because that's what I do. And when we, when we have all these titles, what is the purpose? It, it feeds the ego and the pride. Well, let me tell you about the scribes and the Pharisees, because they were an interesting lot, and Jesus, of course, talking about them. The Talmud, which is the rabbinical writings for Judaism, the Talmud distinguished seven different kinds of Pharisees. And I wonder if we can see either ourselves or glimpses of others in these descriptions. Seven different kinds of Pharisees. There was the shoulder Pharisee. He was meticulous of, in his observance of the law. And, of course, he would wear his good deeds on his shoulder. He professed, I mean, here he was, he, he was out for a reputation, a reputation for purity and goodness. That's what he was doing. True, he obeyed the law. However, he did so in order to be seen of men. You know anybody like that? Then there was the wait-a-little Pharisee. He was the Pharisee who could always produce an entirely valid excuse for putting off a good deed. He professed the creed of the strictest Pharisees, but he could always find an excuse for allowing the practice to lag behind. He spoke, but he did not do it. Have you ever met one of them? Then there was the bruised or bleeding Pharisee. I found this one interesting. The Talmud speaks of the, the plague of self-afflicting Pharisees. These Pharisees received their name for this reason. You see, women had a very low status in Palestine. No really strict Orthodox teacher would be seen talking to a woman in public, even if that woman was his own wife or sister. These Pharisees, though, they went even further. They would not even allow themselves to look at a woman on the street. In order to avoid doing so, they would shut their eyes, and so they ended up bumping into walls and buildings and other obstructions. And thus they bruised and wounded themselves, and their wounds and bruises gained them this, this special reputation for their exceeding piety and holiness. <laughs> now, I'm not saying we know any of them, but if you do, let me know. I would be interested in that. And then... The fourth one here, there was the Pharisee who was variously described as the pestle and the mortar Pharisee, or the humpbacked Pharisee, or the tumbling Pharisee. Such men walked in such ostentatious humility that they were bent like a pestle and a mortar, or like a hunchback. They were so humble that they would not even lift their feet from the ground and so tripped over every obstruction they met. Their humility was a self-advertising ostentation. 
I see that today in some Christians. I've been in some places where I say, hey, how are you doing today? And they say, better than I deserve. I'm such a sinner. You know what I call them? You ever see Winnie the Pooh? You remember Eeyore? <laughs> I call them the Eeyore Christians. How are you doing? Better than I deserve. Beautiful day out. Probably gonna rain. Let's go for a drive. We'll get a flat tire. <laughs> These are the Eeyore Christians, right? The mortar and pestle Christians. Well, then there was the ever-reckoning or compounding Pharisee. And this kind of Pharisee was forever reckoning up his good deeds. Um, he was forever striking a balance between himself and God. And he believed that every good deed he did put God a little further in his debt. Imagine that. And to him, religion was always to be reckoned in terms of a profit and loss account. If I do this, this, and this, then God's really going to, you know, he's got to answer my prayer because, because I've given this much money. I've taken care of these many people. I fed the hungry. I mean, for sure, he's going to answer something that I ask him. Then there was the timid or fearful Pharisee. He was always in dread of the divine punishment. You know, God was like Santa Claus, making a list, checking it twice to see who's naughty or nice. Or he was a lawyer. God was a lawyer and a judge. And boy, my eyes are on you. I'm watching what you do. The timid and fearful Pharisee was always in dread of divine punishment. He was therefore always cleansing the outside of the cup, as Jesus would say, so that he might seem to do good. He saw religion in terms of judgment and life in terms of a terror-stricken evasion of this judgment. Boy, if I mess up, he's going to, you know, a lightning bolt is going to get me. He's going to get me. I'm done. One thing I do wrong, it's over. And finally, there was the God-fearing Pharisee. He was the Pharisee who really and truly loved God and found his delight in obedience to the law of God, however difficult that might be. And beloved, that should be us, the one who truly loves God, the one that sees God as a merciful, loving God who isn't there just waiting to smash us, to judge us, to cast us in hell, to belittle us and chastise us. He is a God of love and mercy, forgiveness. And even if he chastises us for something we've done wrong, it is never to crush us or hurt us and destroy us. It is always to form us into a beautiful vessel fit for the master's use. So these are seven different Pharisees and there's seven different ways to come to God, to view God in our prayer life, to understand him as we live daily, seeking him and talking to him and praying to him. And I wonder, where are you with him? So their prayers were more for public consumption than true appeals to God. And that's something we really have to keep an eye on, right? I know I do. I have to be careful on this point when I offer a closing prayer, right? It does not become a postscript to my message entirely so that I'm actually using the prayer to reemphasize the main points of my message, hoping that people really got them. It's so easy to address the prayer to the people rather than to God. And to be more interested that the people heard the prayer than that God heard the prayer. Sometimes in a prayer group, the same thing happens. People are sitting in a group 
with their eyes closed and when it comes to their turn they begin to talk about everything under the sun they can even use it as a gossip session in the form of a prayer god just wants you to be real if all you can say is lord i need you and you cry that's a beautiful prayer if all you can say is help lord and it's from the heart, that's a beautiful prayer. Many prayers are intended to press, impress people more than impress God, right? But some have actually questioned the value of public prayer. However, Jesus spoke of agreeing in prayer. We need to agree in prayer. The book of Acts tells us how that the disciples all agreed in one accord in prayer. Let me read to you a few verses. Acts chapter 4, verse 24, we're told, And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. And they said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. One accord. In Acts 12, 5, Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. That's intercessory prayer, praying for others, especially people in prison. That's where Peter was. Acts 12, 12. And when they had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together, praying. Those were early prayer groups in the church, the book of Acts. And so God wants us to be of one accord. He wants us, especially if we're in a group of people praying. We pray for one another. We pray with one another, not long-winded prayers, not prayers to be heard of men, but prayers to God for one another. These are the things that move him. Another negative in regards to prayer is in the length of prayer. You know, it's funny, we're, we're told use not vain repetitions, right? Because using vain repetitions so that the prayer may be spent in a long time in some, in some ways. Now, that does not mean repetitious prayers are wrong. Some people pray a Hail Mary and Our Father, the Jesus Prayer. These are ancient forms of prayer, and they do say them over and over. But remember, we're told, use not vain repetitions. Vain repetitions is not one word. In other words, there's repetition in our prayer, and then there's vain repetition. It's a hard issue. Where is your heart when it comes to prayer? Do you see and do you understand and do you know that you can say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, a hundred times. And if you say it a hundred times with your heart, it's a beautiful thing. Beautiful thing. If you say it once with your heart, you've prayed it a hundred times. It's a beautiful thing. You see, it's always a heart issue in our prayer. And maybe sometimes we're not comfortable praying. We just don't feel that we really know how to do this. Well, that's why I chose this passage today, When You Pray. Jesus gives us some very clear examples on how to do it. And he even gives us the Lord's Prayer, which we all know and which I read in the Gospel. Prayer can become a matter of rote, reciting over and over the same thing with no heart. That's not good. But prayer should be as an intelligent conversation with your closest friend. There are times you just talk to him. When you're walking around the home, when you're laying in bed, and you wake up in the morning, you don't feel like getting up yet, and you're just sitting there thinking, pray. If you wake up in the middle of the night like me sometimes at three in the morning or four in the morning, pray. 
Don't worry about things that you have to do or just start praying to the Lord, talking to him. Lord, thank you for all that you've done in my life. And Lord, forgive me for anything I've done wrong and, and help me to be able to walk in your commandments, to be genuine in my faith to you and in my love to one another. That's a simple talking to God. You should just talk to him and listen as God speaks to you. When my children were little, I always would teach them, you know, how does, how do you speak to God? And they would say, prayer. And I'd say, how does God speak to you? And they would say, in his word. Those are two primary ways. You see, prayer is a, is a two-way conversation. And so we need to learn how to do that. We, we speak to God from our heart in prayer and we listen to him either in silence or through reading the word of God. And we can hear him as he speaks to us through his word. You do not have to sustain your notes. You know, I always think it's strange <laughs> Then when some people pray, their voice changes. They lapse into this King James language. That, now where they use rep, repetitive phrases, you know. O Lord, thou most holy, mighty, awesome God, immortal, invisible. Really, I, you know, I mean, if you really want to do it that way, but I think it's rather strange. My most meaningful times in prayer is when I sit on a chair and I just talk to God as though he's sitting in a chair right next to me. Or when I go for a walk and just talk to him. Or if something's on my mind and I just say, you know, Father, I, I'm a bit discouraged today and I, I need you. And, you know, that's what it is. And that is prayer. That is prayer. Sometimes when I walk down the halls at uh, the Kirkland Village or in other places, you can't see now because I have a mask on, but there are times when my, my mouth is moving and I don't think I'm talking to myself. I'm not crazy. <laughs> I'm usually praying. Praying for things that are going on at Kirkland Village or other places. Um, you know, Westminster Village, Easton Home, anywhere. Uh, that needs help, that needs guidance, that the residents need some grace poured upon them from the Lord. I always ask him these things. Jesus tells us that they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. He's talking about the Pharisees and their prayer. And James tells us that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. He didn't say that long prayers avail much. And sometimes that really happens. I, I meet people who will, in a prayer group, pray such long prayers. I don't know if they think they're going to be heard because it's so long and detailed or if they're doing it for the very reason that I can hear them doing it. I don't know. But long prayers don't avail much. Fervent prayers do. Now the proper place for prayer is a quiet, isolated place. We're told, you know, go into the closet and shut the door, Jesus said. It's a place of quiet isolation is what he's saying. Um, we've all had a time of isolation with this pandemic now. And that should have afforded us a lot of time to pray. And it certainly can and will, as we're still somewhat in that situation. Utilize the time. Utilize the time to pray. Carve out two times a day that you're going to sit for 15, 20 minutes in your living room on the couch, silent, talking to the Lord. Make a list of three, four, five things you want to bring before him. 
Do that in the morning and do it in the evening. God will be honored and pleased with that. Pray to your father, Jesus said, who sees in secret. Nobody else is around, but he sees you. He knows where your heart is and he knows what you're doing. And the result is that your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. He'll do it. I can't tell you how many times God has provided um, for me. One, uh, one of the ways that I usually describe it is um, some years ago, I was working on my doctorate and I was typing and, and I needed to print something. My printer broke. And at the time, I didn't have enough money to go get a whole new printer. I needed a, a certain kind, which was rather expensive. And I'll be honest with you, I was a little frustrated and I kind of said, Lord, help. What am I going to do here? With the panic, it was more my panic than trust in him. <laughs> Nevertheless, my phone rang about half hour, 45 minutes after my printer broke. And a gentleman I know was on the phone. He said, hey, Tim, listen, I just went out today because I wanted to get a, a, a new printer and I needed a fax machine and all that stuff with it. So I got me this big fancy job. But my old printer works perfectly and I didn't know who to call. I figured I'd call you to see if you could use it. You tell me that was coincidence. Come on. Pray to your heavenly father in secret. And he will reward you openly. That's the God we worship. Your father knows that you have need of things before you even ask him. He knows it. That tells me that prayer is not share time with God. How many times in prayer we try to inform God of all that's going on in our lives, right? He knows what's going on in our lives. Sometimes I have found it difficult, right, to pay attention when someone's trying to relate their problems to me. Because just like God would listen to us relate our problems to him, we shouldn't have to go over every detail. And yet when people come to me to relate their problems, some, every detail. It often goes something like this, right? Well, I really don't know why I'm here, but well, I might as well start from the beginning. See, back in 1946, or no, maybe it was 47. Let's see. It was a year I got back from the trip from Hawaii where I was visiting my uncle. No... I think I saw my cousin that year. It must have been 1947 because that's the year my aunt died. Now, let me think. Did she die in 46 or 1947? My aunt was really a special person to me. We used to visit her quite often until she moved to Washington State. You know, that was a horrible move for her. She really didn't want to move. But she had lost her job. Or she was just laid off. It was just a terrible time for her over there. Now, the person hasn't even really related to me their problem, but I now am getting a very detailed history of their life and their relations and cousins and everybody else. I think that sometimes we feel it necessary to give God every little detail in our prayer, just like people like to give every detail when they come with their problems. You know what? He knows all the little details of your situation. He really does. Your father knows what you need before you have ever asked him. And we don't have to go on a long litany of everything. He knows all these things. And you might say to me, well, pastor, if he knows what I need before I ask him, then why do I even ask? You know, there's an interesting passage in John the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 16. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, 
he may give it to you. Notice not will or shall give it to you, but may give it to you. It's as though he knows your need and desires to give you, to meet that need in your life, but is waiting for you to ask that he may give it to you. As James said, you have not because you've asked not. Is that you? The asking is what opens the door to allow God to do that which he is longing to do in your life. God will not violate your free will. Don't think he will. And prayer is giving to him the permission to do the thing he desires to do in me and for me, in you and for you. While on the subject of prayer, it's important to remember that the true purpose of prayer is never to get our will done on earth, but his will. So, beloved, I hope we're learning a lot about prayer today. That when you pray, these are the things we need to remember. The things we shouldn't do and the things we should do in our prayer. Prayer gives us the opportunity, really, to cooperate with God in accomplishing his will upon the earth. It is joining forces with God to advance his kingdom on the earth. That is what we're called to do. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. To every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And lo, I will be with you, even to the end of the age. He's never left you. And if he's with you, talk to him. For he is our God. Let's pray. Father, we forget so often that our prayers can become very rote or that we feel that we're just mouthing words. But you ask us to be real. You ask us to pray with our hearts. You ask us to seek you, and you will be found of us. That we can come and talk to you as a friend, and that you listen, that we have not because we ask not. Help us with our prayer lives. Help us to focus more upon you, that we may, going forward, develop a crucial and vital relationship with you every day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oftentimes we, we, we find that our prayer lives have become dry, that we, we feel as if we've walked into a desert. But beloved, the Lord is good. The Lord can make springs rise up in that desert and in your heart and my heart. All he asks is you come to him. And if you don't know how to pray to him, he said, in this manner, therefore pray. And I'm going to close today reading the Lord's Prayer with you one more time. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Receive the benediction. Go in peace to love the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved, go in peace and love the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Pray to him. Draw near to him, and he will draw near to you. God bless each of you and have a wonderful week.